Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing well, Bryce. I have a question for you. Oh, please. Candy corn, yes or no? Uh, great question. Um, I have a feeling I'm, we might lose some listeners on this, but um, I'm a fan of candy corn. I like it. I know a lot of people do not like it. They get disappointed when they get it trick or treating, but I, I, I like it. Like for once a year, a handful of them. Let's go for it. How about you? Uh- no, I I do not care for it. So this is good. You know, there's always someone that our listeners can identify with on these on these pressing issues. I ask because we currently have a poll running at the Capilano Library uh, where I work, and uh, people can vote on if they like candy corn or. Want, would give it a pass. And normally, I stay out of these polls um like to see kind of how people vote how it ends up this time i was walking by i was compelled my sticker went firmly on the no side (laughs) automatically yeah i'm like i need to make a statement here how like what roughly do you think is the voting is it predominantly i don't like candy corn It was pretty split when I last checked it. So I think, you know, this could be another race down to the wire. Dogs versus cats was another very um, close contest. And I think candy corn could be headed for that same outcome. Wow. Well, I, if it helps, I saw a TikTok the other day where somebody took like, kind of, it was almost looked like a, like a soup can size of caramel and they put candy corn all on the outside of it, stuck it into this caramel. So it looked like a giant piece of like (laughs) corn on the cob. Um, It looked kind of cool, but I'm like a lot of people that probably just really upset their stomachs, even just looking at that. Now corn on the cob is a firm. Yes. For me. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, okay, so but maybe I'm glad... not candy corn on a cob. Yeah, I'm glad there's some <laughs> still some things we can agree on. Definitely. So you know, very good timing, by the way, for you bringing up candy corn because, of course, we are in. Uh, we love this time of the year. We're in spooky season. Halloween is uh, it's still about uh, ten days away or so when you when you listen to this episode of the podcast. And uh, with that, of course, it's always interesting to kind of go back and look at like horror movies and you know there's so many halloween type movies you know we we look at and one of those movies and it's funny because i don't necessarily associate this horror movie with halloween per se but when you think of horror movies like this is like the horror movie that you're putting at the top of your list for best horror movies or scariest movies of all time uh and of course that so what we're chatting all about on today's episode is The Exorcist, which this year in 2023 is actually the 50th anniversary of its release. And it's interesting because, uh, Caroline, you might be talking about this a little bit later on, but the movie was originally released, I think, around Christmas time yeah. of uh, 1973. So nothing uh, quite brings the family together like a putting the whole family in the station wagon in 1973 and heading down to the theater to check out The Exorcist. <laughs> when you first mentioned uh, doing it on, on the podcast and uh, I looked at the the release date, I thought that you wanted to do it for our Christmas episode. And <laughs> I was on board. I was thinking, oh, okay. And then, then you said, so we'll do this episode coming up in a few weeks. And I realized, oh, that probably will make more sense to do it around yeah. halloween yeah but that's okay though It, uh yeah i mean we're gonna ch- be chatting all about the exorcist today and the making of the movie and our favorite scary scenes and our favorite scary movies so this is going to be a great episode um and joining us today uh, i couldn't think of a better guest to have for this one uh he is actually he was the associate producer of the hit horror film skin of a rink and a library assistant here at our Stanley A. Milner Library. Uh, we want to welcome back to the show uh, John Kamech. John, you were last on our Skin and Rink episode back in January. Um, I know you're really busy around that time. Have things at least slowed down for you a little bit now? 
Uh, yeah, it has slowed down. Um, yeah, and thanks for having me back again. This was uh, definitely a lot of fun last time, and uh, I'm looking forward to this to this episode. Uh, yeah, th- things have still slow- have slowed down. Um, I mean, I think it has like maintained, you know, an in- it's like an interesting. It's maintained its its like place in cultural, you know, in horror conversation this year. Um, like just this week, Variety updated their their um, top horror movies of the list of the year, and um, we're still at number one for Variety. Wow! Um, which awesome. I, yeah, Variety loves us. Um, so that's uh, you know, so that's awesome. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it it's certainly you know we're, we're like nine months nine months away now. It was really cool as well to see uh, the little uh, toy phone that oh, is yeah. so prominent in the movie. That kind of became a meme for a little while, but uh, yeah, that, that was that was pretty neat. We, I mean, there's still you know people are still making memes. Um, I've still seen like some podcasts recently that have covered it. Um, you know, there, there, I mean, because it's October, there's been kind of a push. You know, like people are doing their October horror month, and so you know more people are talking about it a bit again. And I mean, we've also got uh, it's screening again at the Metro um, on October 29th. Uh, along and um, Kyle Ball, who's the director, uh, he's uh, curating uh, that evening. So we've got uh, uh, so there's Kwai Don playing at 6:30, which is one of his top movies, um, and then followed by Skin and Rink later. So so that's it. The, that's that Halloween weekend at, at Metro. Nice. Well, uh, yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, we did a whole episode on Skin and Rink. So if you have watched it, check out that episode. If you haven't yet, uh, you can borrow it from us here at the library. Go check it out in the theater. That would be my personal, that would be my personal recommendation. So go check it out the Metro if you haven't yet. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an awesome movie and especially knowing it was uh, made here in Edmonton. So before we get to our overdue finds picks, uh, I'd like to let everybody know that tickets for our next Forward Thinking Speaker Series event are now on sale. You won't want to miss Christine Sinclair, Scoring Success, presented by the Edmonton Community Foundation on Sunday, November 19th at the Edmonton Convention Center. In this moderated event, Christine will recount her incredible story of humble beginnings in Burnaby, BC, developing a love and passion for the game of soccer. Her commitment to excellence, hard work, dedication, and ability to not let adversity get to her led to unbelievable successes as both a member of the Portland Thorns and captain of the Canadian National Women's Soccer Team. So the best part is tickets for this event start at just $10 each, with proceeds supporting our Ready, Set, Read program. Grab your tickets at epl.ca slash speaker series, or visit Eventbrite and uh, secure your tickets. Uh, We've been getting lots of interest about this event. Um, Actually, Caroline's been really cool. I've gotten quite a few emails into our events team um, from soccer teams wanting to purchase large groups of tickets tickets uh for their kids teams to go so it's really cool we've done all these forward thinking speaker series events and um a lot a lot of times they're in the evenings and of course they're targeted towards adults so this one i think we're gonna have lots of uh, families at and young soccer players it's gonna be awesome i can already kind of picture and feel the energy and excitement that will be in the audience and i know that the the q a part will just fuel that so i think it'll be a really neat event absolutely all right so before we get uh talking about the exorcist let's share some of our own overdue finds that we've been enjoying lately uh john uh how about you what have you been enjoying do you have a horror pick for us this week uh, I don't have a horror pick. I was going to go a little different uh, direction. Um, so I, so the one I'm going to go with is um, Gabor Mate's The Myth of Normal, uh, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Um, I'm just like, I've got like 10 pages left on it right now. But uh, I, I really think I would recommend it to really anyone. Um, I think anyone would take something out of that book that would benefit their life. Yeah, we actually, speaking of the Forward Thinking Speaker Series, we actually hosted uh, Gabor Mate here in Edmonton. I want to say maybe like 2015 or 2016. And I know um, we've actually had quite a few people request that uh, that we bring him back. So I haven't had a chance to to read that book, though. But um, uh, it sounds like, and I don't know too much about him, but it sounds like his uh, his work is definitely touches a lot of people. And I think it's because trauma touches everyone in some way. And I think, you know, he's he's really, um, the way he talks about, you know, trauma and the way it kind of reverberates across cu- our culture and society. I th- and I think he is, you know, very compassionate. And I think he 
brings a lot to it as well from his own personal story. And he talks about that quite significantly um, in his in his work. Yeah, it's great recommendation right now, for sure. Caroline, uh, how about you? What have you been enjoying lately? I also decided to go a little different than a horror recommendation. So I went with the novel Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, <laughs> Curtis Sittenfeld is a writer who I've liked for a really long time. One of her first books, maybe her first one, was uh, Prep, about uh, students at a prep academy boarding school. She's also written um, uh, American Wife and Rodham, which are about, respectively, uh, Laura Bush and Hillary Clinton. And it's it's this; those ones are kind of existing in this weird real person fiction of fic- a fictionalized life of a very real person in a very real historical context. Um, so those ones were really interesting. This one, though, is about Sally, who's a comedy writer at a fictionalized SNL type thing. Anytime there's Anytime there's like, oh, they write a sketch show. It's no one ever says like, oh, a fictional mad TV. It's always SNL that's on there. So Sally, she's tired of seeing beautiful actresses at falling for ordinary com- male comedy writers. And she's developed a little bit of a complex about this. Noah is a music star who's tired of being underestimated. And they meet when he is the host and music musical guest at the show but over the course of the week as close as they get to falling for each other they ultimately have a falling out that puts them on separate paths for many years enter one worldwide pandemic they become pen pals emailing back and forth with each other and slowly start to rekindle what they had started at the show but can two people from such different worlds different sections of hollywood end up making it work i mean my gut says no but my heart says yeah yeah absolutely yeah Yeah. i totally picture this kind of being like liz lemon on uh, 30 rock a little bit it's very much like liz lemon and very like in 30 Rock, uh, one of her common themes to her storylines was the question of having it all. And uh, whether that's family, romance, uh, success, fame, um, professional acclaim, there's elements of that in, in Sally, in the character of Sally as well. Um, there's definitely, I mean, write about pete davidson without tell me you're writing about pete davidson (laughs) and the discourse around how does this guy end up dating who he's dated over the last few years um i i think there is something my favorite part of the novel is when they get to the emails um because you are then it's the story shifts to a storytelling format that is exclusively through email. So you are kind of having this epistolary novel coming out of um, a a broader one. I wouldn't classify this one as a a romance or romantic comedy, oddly enough. I think it is closer to um, a more general uh, literary fiction. Um, But uh, I think it captures it it does some really interesting stuff with the the characters and that's my doorway as a as a reader is around strong characters so i'm fine with there being very little plot to speak of it's really just these two people set up and then you know can they make it work nice well it sounds like a fun read at least anyway um as we get as it gets a little bit cooler outside, that sounds like a great book to uh, curl up on the couch with. Absolutely. So that was my pick. Bryce, what do you have for us this week? I do have a movie this week, and I was tempted to go with a horror movie, but we're going to be chatting all about the the perfect horror movie here in a, in a few minutes. So I thought I'll save it for another day, but um, I actually have, I would, yeah, this more it's more of a drama than anything, but it's not like a, 
it's not like a deep drama, but um, so this is a movie actually that I saw earlier this year, and uh, everybody I know who I've talked to about this, like it's funny, I saw it in the theater, and like the next week I came into work and I was like, oh, have you seen this movie yet? You got to go see it, and I really enjoyed it, but it's not like good enough to probably be my favorite movie of the year, so I won't talk about it on the show later this year. But um, I'm actually uh, talking about the movie Air. So this actually tells this true story story of how Nike risked everything to sign a young basketball player who had never played in the NBA. Uh, You may know him. He goes by the name of uh, Michael Jordan. So uh, this movie is actually really fascinating. Um, And it's funny because it's hard to think of a time when Nike wasn't the biggest shoe company on earth. But in 1986, uh, Nike was more known for their running shoes and not basketball shoes so and at the time most nba players were actually playing in converse or adidas Um, nike's basketball department needed a hit and uh, marketing rep sonny vaccaro who's played in this movie by matt damon does everything in his power to convince the hires the higher ups uh, at nike that they need to sign this young rookie named michael Jordan. So um, it's actually a really fascinating look at how the deal with uh, Nike and Michael Jordan came together and really how it turned into possibly the most important sports partnership of all time. Um, now, obviously, uh, I've chatted about this on the show before. I'm a, I'm a marketer. I'm not a librarian. So uh, this movie has lots of uh, mar- marketing in it, and it's all about Nike talking about how they're going to promote Michael Jordan. But don't worry for those of you not in marketing or you're thinking to yourself, this sounds horrible, Bryce. I don't want to watch a movie about marketing. Trust me, you will enjoy this movie. Um, there's, it doesn't really go super deep into marketing, but really it's just about that's the story of how the partnership between Nike and Michael Jordan came to be. Um, especially too with Air Jordans. It's really fascinating because in the movie you see Air Jordans being made like the first pair and it's like, Oh, they have multiple colors, but basketball players in the NBA aren't allowed to wear shoes with multiple colors in them. And Nike's like, "That's fine. We'll we'll pay we'll pay Michael Jordan's um, uh, fines from the NBA. We want him wearing these shoes." So it's really interesting look at the making of probably the most iconic brand of uh, sneakers of all time. Um, but yeah, great performances in it. It's funny. Uh, Matt Damon plays uh, Sonny Vaccaro, as I mentioned. Matt Damon looks absolutely nothing like the real Sonny Vaccaro. So they, you, yeah, just kind of Google Sonny Vaccaro and you'll, you'll get a little bit of a kick out of it. Um, but yeah, we also have Ben Affleck in it, who also directs this movie. He plays a Nike founder, Phil Knight, Jason Bateman, Chris Tucker, and Viola Davis, who's awesome in everything, is just as great in this movie. And she plays Michael Jordan's uh, mother. So um, yeah, it's a great, really entertaining movie. We have it in our collection. And uh give it a try. I think you'll like it. That movie, as you mentioned, we have it in our collection. Uh, so place a, a hold on it and request a copy, but also keep your eye out because I know it's on our hits to go the bestseller Ooh. collection. Uh, so keep an eye out for it. The next time you're in a branch, sometimes you will stumble across uh, and luck out on a title you might be waiting for. All right, so let's get into it. Today, of course, we are talking all about The Exorcist, who this year is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary of its release. Um, Caroline, you got some fun facts for us, so... uh, Lay it on us. Let's hear it. I, I I might have oversold them this time, but we'll they're not see. fun. Well, <laughs> it, it's it's it, they're facts. I'll give you that. So, okay. uh, uh, so The Exorcist is a 1973 movie directed by William Friedkin, based on a 1971 novel by William Peter. Blatty. Uh, the novel was not selling well until William Peter Blatty decided, hey, I'm just going to go on television and start talking about demonic possession and exorcisms. And that caught on. Uh, people started reading the novel and uh, the movie became a success they did not anticipate. The movie is about a young girl played by Linda Blair who becomes possessed by a demonic presence. Her mother played by Ellen Burstyn tries to save her through 
an exorcism. It was released on December 26th. Audiences stood in line around the theaters uh, because of so many sold out shows. Um, and anyone queuing up in December weather for a, a movie knows or is pretty committed uh, to getting in and seeing it. Uh, the movie gained popularity through reports that people were fainting and vomiting during the screenings. There was also a uh, controversy around the film's rating. It did have an R uh, rating, but was super popular among children. So there were questions around how that was happening. Uh, the movie won two Oscars for sound and adapted screenplay and is considered the first horror movie to be nominated for a Best Picture Oscar. The original run grossed $193 million with a total gross of $441 million with the re-releases. The movie had two sequels, uh, Exorcist 2 released in 1977 and Exorcist 3 in 1990. There were prequels that followed in 2004 and 2005 and a Fox TV series had two seasons starting in 2016. Although the film shoot is rumored to be cursed and we'll talk probably a bit about that and you know how true these curses really are uh one of the stars who was injured on the original uh filming ellen burston did return for the exorcist believer which was released on october 6 2023 just recently um it was released in theaters uh, a week early to avoid competing with the concert film Taylor Swift The Era's Tour. And so now I think The Exorcist versus Taylor Swift is something that I'm just going to put out in the universe. Yeah, who knew that, you know, on an episode about The Exorcist that Taylor Swift would even come up. So uh, I have to tip my hat to you on that one, Caroline. That was, that was good for you to get that in there. Thank you. So those are the those are some basic facts um, uh, about the Exorcist that I know we will add on to throughout the recording mm -hmm. today. So I'm really curious to know, uh, John. I'm going to start with you. Uh, when did you first watch The Exorcist? I first watched it when I was I think about 16 or 17. And to be totally honest, the first time I watched it, I was pretty underwhelmed. And I think because, you know, at the, when I was a teenager, you know, you read this about it's the scariest movie ever made. And so I think that leads you to go in with very high expectations. And then, you know, I was kind of, at the end, I was kind of like, that's it, really? Like, that's, you know, this is like the scariest movie ever made. Like, it, it, it really didn't scare me. Um, and then I just rewatched it about a week ago. Uh, I think that was for the, maybe the first time I've rewatched it. Um, and I would still say it doesn't scare me. But I think that it, I, I have a, I think I have a greater appreciation for it now. Um, I think it definitely has an undeniable power as a film. And I think that all kind of comes, um, you know, from the story, the underlying like religious and spiritual aspects of it, you know, the all like the entire way it was made, which, which I kind of want to talk about, you know, I hope we'll get into that. So I would say like, it's, to me, it's an excellent film um, that doesn't personally scare me. But um, I can understand why it would be, like, terrifying to other people. I think it, a lot of it comes down to, for me, I think the reason that, like, it's scary for people really comes down to their own personal beliefs. Yeah, it's interesting to hear. I, I, I totally get it. Like, I can definitely see how when the movie was first released in 1973, and I kind of made it in my notes, I'm just like, this movie, like, if it came out like this today, like, people would be up in arms over some of the content in, in the movie. So I, I can only imagine how shocking it was to people 50 years ago, um, watching this for the first time. So yeah, definitely when you hear like, Oh, this is the scariest movie of all time and you get yourself amped up and you're like, eh, is it really that scary though? But Caroline, how about you? Like when was the first time you watched it? Yeah, I probably watched it in my mid teens, similar and uh, I had, uh, I also was underwhelmed by it. Years <laughs> later, I uh, 
was watching it for a second time and realized, oh, the first one I saw, that was the TV cut. That was the television edit. This is a very different movie that I am watching right now than the one I thought I had seen. And so that... um, I think that shaped my experience with with The Exorcist. Um, I, I I wouldn't say I'm a, I'm a particularly a f- horror fan. It's uh, I I love movies, and so I'll watch I'll watch really anything. Um, and I've talked about on the show before that uh, in my teens I gave myself the mission of you know watching all of the movies on the American Film Institute's 100 greatest movies and you know getting caught up on things so if somebody was calling it the most the scariest the best I was there I wanted to see it Um, I wanted to you know cross it off in my little book of like Oscar nominees and uh I watched it for the experience of watching it. And I think that that was what stuck with me. Even now, this was, this was my third watching. And there were times, particularly in the first, first third to half of the movie where I'm like, have I actually seen this movie before? I do not remember this part at all. Uh, So yeah, there are definitely some parts that stick to me as a viewer. And then others where um, I could not, tell i i would not be able to point it out as part of the exorcist but bryce uh, were you overwhelmed when you saw it whelmed underwhelmed so i i was trying to figure out when i first watched this i think it was about like 13 or 14 i think was the first time and i was just like really at that age starting to like really get into like movies and like reading about older films and i remember I don't know if it was a premier magazine at the time, but they had this like issue on movies from the seventies and I read it and I was like, Oh my God, these like, these are movie titles I had heard of before, like the Godfather or apocalypse now, or obviously uh, the exorcist is in there. Um, But I was like, these movies all sound amazing. Like I'm like, I'm going to go rent these. And so I was on this like weird as a 14 year old boy going on all this weird kick of watching old seventies movies. And eventually of course came across uh, the exorcist and um, yeah, heard the same thing as everybody else. This is like the scariest movie of all time. Um, I, yeah, it definitely did freak me out. I remember when I watched it and I probably at that time would have said that was the scariest movie I had ever seen. Um, My pick now has changed and we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, but it definitely disturbed me for sure. Like it was just like, there's only been a few movies in my life where I remember watching it as a young teenager and being like, I shouldn't be allowed to watch this. And that was the exorcist and a clockwork orange. When I first watched it, I was just like, they should have not let me write this movie. I'm not prepared for this. Um, but no, yeah, right. no, it was, I mean, definitely kind of blew me away. And it would just kind of made some of the, uh, you know, Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street that I was used to watching at that age just seem very, very tame and kind of lame by comparison. In the past, when we've talked about episodes like the ones on Dungeons and Dragons, you've talked about the through the the eighties with the Satanic Panic era. Were there any concerns that you were inviting the evil into your home by <laughs> renting this movie? No, definitely not. Uh, more so, being like as the oldest of uh, two siblings at the time, I didn't want to seem like. I was scared or like I had like a nightmare because of this, this movie. So, um, yeah, I was not, I was not too concerned about, uh, letting demons into the home at at all. (laughs) Uh, so I mean, what we've talked about, uh, different parts of this, what, what does stand out to you from the movie? Um, or that you've since found out around the making of it, favorite scenes, characters, or, uh, themes in it, John? Um, I mean, I would say like the, the most overtly shocking scene is probably the crucifix scene. And, you know, I think that's still, um, you know, I think it, it, like it is, it is pretty stunning when, and, and I think it's a great point that, uh, you made Bryce that, 
uh, it's it's really hard to judge now because you know we have an additional fifty years of movies. And even when you know when I saw it, that was like probably like early two thousands. At that point, there was still an, like thirty years of movies that had been made that had been influenced by that by The Exorcist. So yeah, I think it's a great point that um, you know there really hadn't been much like this that was like the main it's like as big of a mainstream hit. Um, I mean, maybe some of Hitchcock's movies, I guess. Um, where there were some similar reactions. But, yeah, it's hard to judge looking back that, that people just hadn't been exposed to things like this before. Um, and so you, you could, yeah, and, and especially with, like, how, you know, the religious aspects of The Exorcist, um, like, how disturbing that would be, you know, for people with specific religious beliefs. Um, I guess I would also say the ending, um, to me, is, you know, there's definitely, like, a... a of like very power the ending is quite powerful i think the use of tubular bells like i like i, I was going to talk and then I, I guess this rolls into my, my last one was the sound i think the sound is phenomenal uh when you go back and, and watch it again and yeah i have another comment about the sound or maybe i'll maybe i'll bring up later but yeah I, I think like tubular bells is one of the most iconic you know theme songs of all time like when you hear that you, you're instantly brought to you know it means the exorcist right <laughs> oh yeah like you you're picturing yourself walking the streets of Georgetown while you listen to it. And it's funny, I didn't realize until we were kind of on a chat together and we were kind of going back and forth a little bit Mm -hmm. about kind of the music in it. And uh, I didn't realize that Tubular Bells, like the original version is like 26 minutes long. Yeah, it's very like, I don't know, contemplative, I suppose. Like, but it has that, it definitely has that kind of darkness and mystery to it as well that I, and it was like one of those, like, you know, just a perfect choice and I was going to bring this up later, but uh, there's a so there's a great but there's a great documentary that I mentioned Bryce about the making of The Exorcist called Leap of Faith, um, and that's on Canopy. And uh, I would honestly recommend anyone to go watch Leap of Faith. It's it's an awesome documentary. Um, and so there's the reason I bring it up now is there's a whole part in that. So so in that one, it's directed by Alexander Philippe, who kind of makes documentaries about film, and. Uh, he does a long-form interview with William Friedkin about the making of The Exorcist, and so there's an entire section where he talks about the sound, and there was, like, several scores um, that were even produced and he rejected. Um, and he even, uh, he talks in there about how, like, he was friends with Lalo Schifrin, like, quite good friends with Lalo Schifrin, who was, the, you know, probably most famously created the Mission Impossible theme song. And Lalo Schifrin had created this huge, like, bombastic, you know, in his style, this this really, like, uh, like powerful score to it and he basically told him like this is wrong this is not like how i envision it for the film and they had like a lifetime fo- like he mentions in leap of faith he's like we, like he we were friends before and he's like we haven't spoken since you know that's quite a sad story but i think he was right and yeah then i mean he talks about how the tubular bells i think he just found it on like an l like he was going through like old LPs or something and he put it on and you know and so it's 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 interesting how these things happen you know like it's just this you know him just looks, searching through a box of old records turns into this you know one of a kind <laughs> iconic horror theme I uh second that documentary recommendation a leap of faith I uh, a couple nights ago I watched I watched that documentary for the first time before rewatching the exorcist which I've seen a handful of times and it was like watching that documentary just kind of made the movie a little bit better almost like hearing kind of some of the behind the scenes stuff from uh William Friedkin as well talking about um yeah the score part and the the story about him losing the friend over kind of like rejecting his score is like, it's sad because also too we've recently lost William Friedkin who knows they probably might not have ever um connected again so yeah it's definitely a uh, a a sad story um but it definitely did kind of make me look at things a little bit differently uh during the film so there's actually a part in the documentary where he talks about a couple of the priests in the movie were like actual priests in in real life and uh the one is kind of uh spoiler alert hopefully you've seen the movie (laughs) if you're listening to this episode but at the end when uh when father Kress throws himself out out the window and then the other priest sees him and he's leading giving him his uh reading him his last rites so during that scene the the priest who's supposed to be reading the rites like cannot like get his lines right it's just not into it so in this documentary william friedkin talks about he just like basically punched this 
real life priest in the face as hard as he could. The priest starts crying, and of course, he's able to get his scene. And William Friedkin in the documentary is just like, "Yeah, you can't do that today anymore." <laughs> like it's just, and he also talks about too. There's some a uh, couple of scenes too where uh, Father Cross is um, there's like a jump scare, and uh, he kind of turns around and and while they were filming, like he fired off like a shotgun basically just to kind of get this like scared reaction uh from the actor so um yeah it's just like i said i mean if you've seen the movie uh, like i cannot recommend watching that documentary and then going back and watching the exorcist itself it'll kind of uh definitely makes you look at things a lot differently uh, but as far as me though as far as like the actual kind of scenes in the movie that really stood out to me the head spin from reagan when she of course is obsessed uh, already and then you know the mom comes in and she's sitting up and you see her head foot spin all the way around it's just it's still shocking and it still looks kind of it's a it's a cool special effect for um 1973 let alone 2023 anyway um and then of course the one thing of course is the the green vomit uh from reagan on uh father crest when uh he first meets her and just like she basically unloads on him and it's it's disgusting but um it's just kind of one of those very iconic scenes from the movie um caroline you mentioned kind of watching it again and like seeing things a little bit uh differently or you're like or you're like um oh i don't remember this scene one of those scenes for me was when the police detective was interviewing ellen burston's character and i for whatever reason because he thinks that reagan had uh murdered this worker who had been kind of looking after reagan and he had basically been thrown out the window and um of course the detectives there to investigate reagan for murdering this guy and just the tension between the ellen burston's character and the police detective and for whatever reason i did not remember that scene too much but it was super tense and uh so well acted that one was interesting to me that's on my list as well because of like the camera work the cinematography of it and like there's constant motion in a scene where the characters are sitting still. I actually became very dizzy watching that scene in particular because of of what was happening with the perspectives around it all and I think that the 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 camera it it does interesting things with perspective and how it shoots the angles of people and characters at different points in it. But just the constant motion in that scene um, was what I was picking up uh, this time through on it. One of the scariest scenes to me, um, or maybe most unsettling to me, is there's a scene mid movie where um ellen burston's character chris is throwing a party and reagan her daughter has been put to bed and comes back to the party tells an astronaut that he's gonna die in space and then urinates on the floor i can't even think of the word for it but it's just it's so matter of fact in the way that Reagan is not herself in that, that I find in some ways that's more scary to me than when she's, you know, in the bed vomiting the, uh, the pea green uh, vomit all over everyone and speaking in tongues and uh, like yeah obviously that's scary that's terrible that's horrific but also so is this like little girl in a domestic scenario that is just behaving in a way that is not her and that I think that that terror that Chris, the character of Chris has around how do I help my daughter? Um, and she's just kind of going, exploring all these avenues and then finally has no other option but to go to a priest for an exorcism. And the priest is like, no, this is ridiculous. No, of course not. And just, she just breaks at that moment of, um, this is the only thing that's left for her to, to reach her daughter. Yeah. That scene in particular, that was when I remember, like when I first watched the movie, that was like, I, I remember kind of being like, okay, here we go. Like the, like that was like, 
this things are about to get really messed up here. And yeah, you're right. Like uh, rewatching that movie again last night. And um, I was just like, it's still shocking to this day. Like you said, she's just, she's not in, she doesn't have her like demon voice yet. Um, you know, 10 minutes earlier, she's like this normal kid. And she kind of like, it seems like maybe she's coming down with something, but, um, just to see her go from this kid who's doing arts and crafts and looking forward to going to the movies with her mom on her birthday. And then she's like, says the line about the astronaut dying and peeing on the, or urinating on the rug. It's just like, yeah, it's still shocking to this day. Can I also mention the, um, there's the famous spider walk scene, which is not in the theatrical cut. Um, but it's, it's interesting that maybe that, that might be one of the most, you know, iconic scenes that's not actually in the original movie. Because I think like the, everybody also knows the spider walk scene. Um, but it's only in the director's cut, um, which came out in, I think 2000. And it's a little bit rough because I think they didn't, they, you know, they didn't fully, um, you know, get it ready. Cause I think, I think William Free can cut it back in, I can't remember the reason that he cut it, but um, you know, it was it's it's like a little bit rougher. You can tell uh, from when it when it did come out um, than the original film. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's also like a you know just a, a very unsettling <laughs> scene. Yeah, I can't think of another you know an, another cut scene that is that that is that emblematic of the film that it's it was in. You know? Yeah, I remember when they re released that in two thousand, and that was like that whole spider walk scene down the stairs. Um, that was like the whole focus of their marketing. It was kind of like, this is the version you haven't seen and kind of would give you a very short snippet of, of that scene anyway. I mean, it, yeah, it's still freaky when you watch it, but yeah, it doesn't like the reason obviously wasn't included back in 1973. Like it just didn't, wasn't quite, wasn't quite there yet anyway, I guess. But yeah, the the making of this movie too, um, like like I mentioned, like this is probably one of the most talked about making of movies of all time too. Of course, there's all these rumors about the film being cursed, and there was there was fires on the set, and then there was also the um, the nurse in the one scene where Reagan is in the hospital, the guy who's wearing the bracelet, which kind of like stands out too to me. It's kind of like this, like I don't know what to call it. It's like a studded bracelet anyway that he's wearing but turned out that guy in real life was a was a killer i guess yeah and he was a convicted murderer yeah 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 so it's you know you can kind of uh read into it but uh yeah the whole making of this film was quite fascinating on its own as well i'm glad you also mentioned the uh the scene in the hospital because i think that like the blood shooting out of her neck is also mm-hmm. like quite disturbing even though that's before really the you know the the key possession scenes start yeah, um, yeah. When I was rewatching it, as somebody who doesn't like to get needles, <laughs> I was like, "Oh man, this scene! I got to watch this again." <laughs> yeah, it uh, they did they did a good job with it, obviously, for as far as uh, practical effects go. And the scene um, that comes shortly after that, where um, uh, they're in like a hospital conference room, and Chris McNeil is just surrounded by all of the people, all of the doctors in their their white lab coats and she's saying that you know all these doctors and they can't tell her anything and she's just surrounded i was fascinated by the color and this was i was saying to brights before before the show started that um more than as a movie like I, i don't know how soon it'll be before i sit down and watch the exorcist again but there's something about the movie that makes me want to tear it into pieces and analyze all of those pieces and i'm watching this and i'm like wow the color blue is so dominant in this movie and the red is so strong and then um when the the priest at the end comes in and he's like get me my purple stole and i'm like oh purple is red and blue together this has to be significant (laughs) and bryce is telling me that if i watch the leap of faith documentary then it's like no it's like it's not what you think but i but it could be and like that's i like I, I want to just look, break it into all of these parts and like analyze it more than I think I want to be scared by it. And I, I love the part in Leap of Faith where, like, yeah, William Friedkin is like, I had no intent of foreshadowing anything with any of these choices. Like he's so, he's so clear on that that you know. And I think that's you know that there's, I think that's a that's an important comment because there's so many of these things 
that are, you know, not intentional. Yeah, that was that was something I really enjoyed about that documentary was hearing William Friedkin be like, yeah, people say this scene symbolizes that, but no, I just thought it, I just thought it looked good and I just shot it that way and like no, it doesn't mean that. So it kind of makes you think a little bit, you know, when you read some movie reviews online and people are like, "Oh, this symbolizes this or symbolizes that." And it's like I'll wait to hear that from uh, the director's mouth, thanks, before I uh, take your word on that. That's an interesting part of, of it, too, is that, you know, these these movies really become yours as well when you watch them, you know. And so, like, it's not that when you see those symbol, like those symbols, maybe it is reading into it, but, you know, that's okay. That's, you know, that's it's your subjective, um, you know, take away from the film. And, you know, when these get released, you know, they're kind of, they're released to everyone, you know, and everybody makes it their own. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what definitely makes movies uh, so powerful. Uh, so after the initial release, uh, Caroline mentioned this, but uh, The Exorcist was followed by some sequels uh, and even a TV show. Uh, John, have you had a chance to see any of the sequels at all? Yeah, I, so I watched the sequels this last week, kind of, um, you know, in preparation for this. Uh, I'd never seen them before. Uh, Exorcist Two: The Heretic, it's, I would say it's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> Um, it has a reputation for being, you know, it was it, like a, a, a pretty significant flop. But I would say that it, I don't think it, I don't think it's maybe as bad as its reputation conveys. It's pretty silly in certain parts. And I think its overall problem is that it's, it's pretty dull. Um, like the, and I think that all goes back to the script. Um, it's just not a, you know, very exciting movie. But it has some standout, a couple standout moments. And I'd say some unintentionally funny parts. One thing that was pointed out to me, actually, the other, uh, when talking about this movie, is I think, I believe Martin Scorsese actually says that he thinks that Exorcist Two is better than the first one, which is a really? very, which is a very interesting opinion. Um, and then Exorcist Three, uh, I just watched it, and I actually, I think Exorcist Three is great. Uh, I don't know if it has the classic factor of the original, but I think it. I, it might I might be more likely to rewatch it. Um, I do think that it's very and that of course in the third one William Peter Blatty, uh, neither William Peter Blatty or William Friedkin had anything to do with the second one famously. And then William Peter Blatty came back for the third one and directed and wrote uh, wrote and directed it. And so I think a lot of people consider that to be the real original you know the real original sequel to it. Um, yeah, and I think I would if you haven't seen it before I would recommend it. And that one is uh, available to stream through Canopy as well. So uh, check it out tonight. Caroline, did you see any of the sequels or the TV show? No, I think I've seen about as much of The Exorcist <laughs> as I'm good with. Um, but uh, I do think that, Bryce, when we have Martin Scorsese on to uh, answer for The End of the Departed, we should definitely mm -hmm. put this on our list of questions to ask him about. Yeah, 2024, Martin Scorsese, we're calling it. He's going to be a guest on Overdue Finds. And uh, yeah, I will def we will definitely be ask him about his hot take on The Exorcist Part 2. I didn't realize there was a TV show until uh, you sent out the notes for this one, Caroline. I, I do not remember that show at all. And yeah, I've never seen Part 2 because uh, same thing, John. I heard it was kind of boring and the movie itself was terrible. But now after hearing you talk about it, I kind of want to watch it actually, even though my expectations are very low for it. So maybe I'll enjoy it a little bit. Um, it kind of view it as a little bit of a kind of campy, I guess. Um, I did actually just a few months ago watch uh, Exorcist Part 3 for the first time um and i remember i th as a kid so i was like i think about nine or ten when that movie first came out i remember my cousin had rented it and like i was barred from watching it like i got booted out of the basement because the adults and the older kids were watching the exorcist part three and i wouldn't be able to handle it so it was like I was like, I'm going to watch this movie eventually one day. Um, I didn't, I didn't like it as much as you did, John. I definitely feel, yeah, you're right. Like you said it perfectly. Like it doesn't have that classic feel to it. Like it definitely felt like a late eighties movie. Like it would just seemed very kind of dated. George C. Scott's in it. He's actually really good in it. Brad Dorif, who does the voice of um, Chucky. Uh, he's in it, he plays the Gemini killer. And there's some like, genuinely like 
frightening scenes in it. Like there's one in particular, John, you'd probably know which one I'm going to be talking about when they're in the, uh, I think it's like an asylum and there's this like fast, like, I don't want to ruin it, but there's like just this cut scene of this. I don't, you don't know if it's a ghost or demon, but this thing's got like these head shears and looks like they're going to like kill a nurse with them. And just the way the whole thing shot, like the instant zoom in, like there's nothing happening until this one scene. And it just, it's just one of the most like scary and disturbing scenes I think I've seen in a, in a movie. Like it's just kind of like, you're not expecting it at all. Like there's no giant setup for it. It's just, punches you in the gut as soon as as soon as it it happens but um i know it has like quite a cult following like i've seen it like be re-released like special editions on blu-ray here over the last few years on anniversaries or whatever but um that's a movie i think i want to give another watch to because um like i said i was i thought it was okay when i watched it but um i'll give it another shot though one of my uh deep thoughts when I was watching The Exorcist was uh, how much it was like Home Alone. And hear me out. <laughs> I, this, I, I was already, this is going to be the poll quote for the episode. But um, when you think about Home Alone, most people will think about the burglars, right? The Kevin uh, being in the house, Kevin playing all these pranks on the on the burglars who are trying to get in. That is, that that's only the last 30 minutes, the last third of the movie. And with the exorcist, I kept like checking the time not because I was bored, but just to see kind of where the stuff you think of, like her in the bed, the head spinning, and and things happened out. It was it was there were things that were sprinkled throughout the early scenes of the movie, but the actual exorcism is very late coming in the movie. Um, uh, Father Karras and Chris McNeil don't even meet until like an hour in to the movie and then there's like the actual priest who does the exorcism isn't there until like the last 20 to 30 minutes of it It, it's both the exorcist and home alone spend a lot of time going through much more mundane things um in the lead up to it that i think actually successfully grounds them in making it so scary or why you care about the characters um and then later on when they are amping up you know in sequels and prequels and everything that follows yes it is the the big thing that people want to see but it also needs to have that grounding you need to believe that um Chris cares about her daughter that they do have this great relationship that she isn't the girl that you see possessed through there. You need to see that in order for there to be um, the meaning of, of what happens in it. So yeah, that was my take on the similarities between home alone (laughs) and the exorcist. I like it. So yeah. So the, so the exorcist does have a place in contemporary horror movie discourse. Why do you think it has remained part of this conversation? Why it's still seen as such a scary movie, right? Yeah. I think just, um, the shocking nature of the film, you see a young, you see a child uh, in the movie, uh, Linda Blair's character, Reagan, I think is 12 or, or 13 years old. Um, and you just, it, the movie itself is just, it's just sheer shocking brutality kind of, uh, once we get into her being possessed and then also of course the exorcism, uh, s- scenes, um, as John mentioned, you know, the part with the, uh, crucifixion, um, and, uh, the way the film was made too, I think you just, especially after watching that uh, Leap of Faith, the documentary with William Friedkin, you know, talking about like hitting actors and I've read stuff too about like um, the working conditions weren't great back then. Like um, Linda Blair, like that scene where she's like in the bed possessed and they had this pulley like jerking her back and forth. And I think to, to this day, she still has back issues because of it. Um, 
the movie itself has kind of taken a life of its own. Like you hear about, oh, this is a cursed, this was a cursed production, and oh, you heard about people fainting or vomiting at screenings of it. And um, I think you know, no matter what comes out uh, over the next fifty years, as far as horror movies go, um, I think fifty years from now, people will be talking about the hundredth anniversary of this movie and still talking about how shocking it is and wow i can't believe they made this movie so long ago so um yeah i just think everything around it is kind of taken a life of its own i think too um again reading a little bit about the making of and how they tried whenever possible to have real effects in place um so the uh to to get their air their puffs of breath showing on screen it really was that cold on set or um if if they're levitating they're on wires and so i think um after this period you you start to see a lot of like special effects that didn't age well um whereas the the techniques used in this one i think ground again ground it in something shockingly real for a movie about demonic possession um for you know for me i think one of the one of the reasons that it's i think i appreciate it more now is i think it's a lot easier to identify with father caress um you know and like even you know i think when you're a little bit older the 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 crisis of faith that he's going through you know is a little bit more you know easily easy to identify and you know just kind of his dissatisfaction with you know, the world and, and his life. And, um, you know, that, I mean, Jason Miller, like Jason Miller does such a great job. Like he just has that wounded look on his face, you know, the entire film. And so I think that's, and then, you know, that that connects with the ending of where, you know, I mean, one interpretation of it is, you know, through that act he gained, he regained his faith, even though it cost him his life. All of these aspects of like the making of it, um, it just comes together into something that, you know, is, is iconic and is, um, you know, beyond just its time. So roundtable questions. You are planning the ultimate 1973 themed movie night. What movie are you going to pair with The Exorcist? Bryce, I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, thanks for sending that list. And I was, because uh, I was, it was funny looking through that list of movies from 1973 and being like, oh, that movie is also celebrating a 50th anniversary release. Um, Paper Moon for me would be uh, my pick that I would pair with uh, The Exorcist, uh, mostly because obviously two way, very different movies. But um, of course, uh, Tatum O'Neill won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. Uh, she, of course, was nominated uh, also with. With Linda Blair from The Exorcist, who also, of course, did a fantastic job as Reagan. So to have these two young actresses uh, going for the Oscar in the same year was must have been really interesting to see. And uh, yeah, my Paper Moon Exorcist double feature would be uh, very interesting, I think. That it was 100% my pick and 100% <laughs> the reason why. So we are in complete alignment <laughs> there. Uh, John, what, what would you pair it with? Uh, so my my top pairing for this one would be Wicker, the Wicker Man, the original oh, Wicker Man, yeah. um, because I mean I think they share a lot in common. You know, it's 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 known as having a very shocking, you know, it's for for being very shocking when it first came out. Um, it's another icon, absolutely iconic ending. You know, some amazing performances. What is the scariest movie you've ever seen, or the most scared you've been while watching a movie? Bryce, you set us up for this earlier. What do you have? So this is a movie that I just watched actually this year as well. For the very first time, it's a movie I'd read about. And all these lists of the scariest movie, uh, the most disturbing movie you've never seen, like all those type of lists. Um, and this movie, it's it was a 1984 made-for-TV film in Britain called Threads. So, uh, th- yeah, Threads... Um, basically shows the effects of a nuclear holocaust on the working class city of Sheffield, England, and shows the eventual long-term effects of nuclear war on civilization. So this movie is like very, it's just grounded in real life. There's no 
like I don't want to say there's no actors in it. People in the movie, of course, are actors, but there's no big names in it, and they do that on purpose. Um, you follow a couple of families at the beginning. Uh, stuff happens with Russia, and uh, a nuclear bomb is is dropped on England, and the rest of the movie is just this dark, depressing, scary. What I assume would be very realistic case scenario of what would happen if like the world actually did get into a nuclear war. Um, so there was a movie that like, like, yeah, it just, it's just a movie that stayed with me probably for a few weeks afterwards. And I would just read these essays about the movie and just, it, it's a movie that I only want to watch. Like I've seen it once. I'm good. I never want to watch it ever again. And it's, uh, especially in today's day and age, just, it's just, freaked me out so uh if you are looking for a depressing movie you can stream threads through us on both hoopla and canopy great john the uh psycho particularly the shower scene was the first time i think i realized that like horror could actually give you like a physiological involuntary reaction and so that's what i would i oh and i'll mention also um because we meant we were talking about leap of faith um alexander philippe also has a documentary about the shower scene um, called 7852, which I would also really recommend. Um, yeah, that's also a, like a phenomenal documentary about film. Nice. I totally forgot about that documentary. I'm going to add it to my uh, watch watch next list because that's one I've always... I remember seeing the ad for it when it first came out. It's always been one I've wanted to watch. Caroline, how about you? I'm curious to see here. Scariest movie you've ever seen or... The 1998 slasher movie Urban Legend. I have no idea why. I I just remember seeing this movie and being so keyed up by it. I, the adrenaline I felt. It took me forever to calm down. I, I, I legitimately do not know why this movie scared me so much. I watched it again not that long ago within the last couple of years and... I could remember, like, it brought back the feeling of being scared. I'm watching it going, what was it? I do not know. Urban legends as a concept I find very interesting and scary. And there was something about this Jared Leto movie that um, I just could not handle. John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really great to talk about this movie. And there are a number of other movies that you can see screening at the Stanley A. Milner Library. We'll have a link to uh, those events in our list of items. We hope that everyone enjoyed today's episode. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show so that you get all of our new episodes. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and most importantly, tell a friend about the show. Yeah, and don't forget that we'll have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. We mentioned quite a few horror movies, so uh, yeah, you get a nice little handy uh, list there so you can uh, place some holds on some great movies. And as usual, we love to hear from our listeners, so you can email us at podcast at epl.ca. Caroline and myself both get those emails, and we love hearing from listeners. You can also share your thoughts about the show with us on Twitter at EPL.ca and by using the hashtag EPLOverduefinds. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.